parties. We'll learn only two of these options for basic word processing, left indent and first line indent. Let's just choose the same paragraph we've been working with. Since the highlight is already in it, choose the Format Paragraph menu again. To select the left indent field, the Tab key must be pressed once to advance the highlight to that field. The highlight will be on a numeric value, which is the distance in inches from the left margin to the left edge of the paragraph. The default is zero. To change this, just type in a new value and press Enter. Let's type a decimal point five for a half inch indentation and press Enter. The entire selected paragraph is indented. Let's do a first line indent. Choose the Format Paragraph command again. This time, the Tab key must be pressed twice to move the highlight to the first line field. The highlight will be on a numeric value, which is the distance in inches from the left edge of the paragraph to the left edge of the first line of the paragraph. The default is zero. To change this, just type in a new value and press Enter. Let's type in a decimal point five for another half inch indentation, then press Enter. The first line is indented and the remaining lines of the paragraph are not. Typeface refers to the type style of the characters available on your printer. Word has many possible type style options, but we only need two of them for basic word processing, namely boldface and underlining. The procedure to choose type style options is similar to that for other formatting options. First, select the text to be given a different type style. Every character in the selection has to be highlighted. Select the same paragraph we've been using by pressing F10. Then choose the format character menu as follows. Press the escape key, then press the F key, followed by the C key. The format character menu has several fields in it and each field has two or more options. Note that the bold field already has the no option highlighted. This is the default when word starts and results in plain face text. To select bold face emphasis, press the Y key and the yes option in the bold field is highlighted. Then press the enter key and the selected paragraph is rendered in bold face on the screen. How the characters actually appear depends upon your monitor's capabilities. For example, you might not see boldface characters until you have moved the highlight out of the paragraph. To find out how characters appear for different display hardware, consult the reference manual Appendix B. Once the rendering is done, the command menu reappears. At this point, you can resume editing or use the command menu again. Essentially, the same procedure is used for underlining text. Be sure to select all the characters to be underlined. Use the same paragraph as above. Once again, choose the Format Character menu in the same way you did for Boldface. This time, though, press the Tab key twice to move the highlight to the Underline field. Note that the Underline field already has the No option highlighted. This is the default emphasis when Word starts and results in text without underlining. To select Underlining Emphasis, press the Y key and the Yes option in the Underline field is highlighted. Then press the Enter key, and the selected paragraph is underlined on the screen, depending on your monitor's capabilities. Once the rendering is done, the command menu reappears. The spell checker matches your text against its dictionary. It then displays to you any words it couldn't find and lets you correct them. Before you use spell checker the first time, be sure it knows where to look for its dictionary. Press the Escape key and the O key to get the options menu in the command area. The entry in the spell field should be the name of the word directory. That's C colon backslash word. If it isn't, change it by pressing the shift and tab keys together, then typing in the correct directory name and press enter. One other thing, if you haven't already done so, move the highlights so that no segment of text is highlighted. Otherwise, the spell checker will check only the highlighted segment of text. To start the spell checker, choose the library spell command from the command menu by pressing the escape key, then the L key, and finally the S key. The message line may notify you that it's saving the document in a work file. In a few seconds, a three-paned window will appear on the screen with a menu of spell commands in the command area. The command proof will be highlighted. Choose it by typing a P. 
The message line displays the message checking document to show speller is checking the text. The speller presents unknown words to you as it finds them. When an unknown word is found, the top and bottom panes of the window are updated. The top pane shows the text containing the unknown word. The bottom panel shows the unknown word and what's wrong with it. A menu of spelling correction commands appears in the command area. Usually, you accept it or correct it. For example, if the word is a true misspelling, press the C key to correct the word. When you do this, the middle pane of the window is filled with a list of suggested corrections from the speller's own dictionary. Either select the correct spelling from the list using the direction keys to highlight it, or type the correct spelling. In either case, press Enter when done. The speller continues checking. If the word is a proper name or technical term that is unlikely to be in a dictionary, press the I key to tell the speller to ignore that word. The speller continues checking until it finds another unknown word. During this review process, the message line displays the number of words checked so far and how many are unknown. After you have reviewed all unknown words, the message Review Done will appear in the message line and the speller will prompt you for the go ahead to correct the document in the work file. Press the Y key and the corrections are applied. A few seconds after that, the edit screen returns and you can resume editing. See how quick that is? Speed is one of the reasons PCs are so useful. A final note on this subject, if you are running Word from a diskette system, then some swapping of disks will be needed. Word will prompt you what disks to swap and when. Two very important subjects are saving and retrieving a document. We'll show you how to store a document onto a disk and how to retrieve it for subsequent work. When you're finished creating a document and want to keep it for future reference, the document should be saved. This is the process of copying it from the computer's main memory to either a diskette or a hard disk. The computer's main memory is volatile, which means its contents are lost if the electrical power is lost. By contrast, the disk is non-volatile, which means its contents remain intact until overwritten by a magnetic device. There are reasons for saving a document other than finishing it. Your document may need editing at some future time. Also, if the document is very long, many days may be needed to write it. So, at the end of each day, you just save it in its current state before quitting Word and turning off the computer. Then the next day, retrieve the document and resume writing it. Finally, for long documents, Veteran computer users do a save every 15 minutes or so in case of power failure. Word provides a transfer menu for saves and retrieves. Here's how to do a save. Press the escape key, then the T key followed by the S key to choose the transfer save menu. The message line displays a prompt to enter the file name. This menu contains a field called file name. Since this is a new, untitled document created in this editing session, the file name field will be blank. Let's name our text file text1. If no path name is included, Word saves the document in the current directory in a hard disk system or on drive B in a diskette system. To save the document anyplace else, the full path name must be included in the file name field. For this lesson, we can ignore the formatted field option in the menu. Press the Enter key to execute the save. The message line now displays a notice that Word is saving the file. The first time a save is done, a document summary sheet may appear in the command area. This summary contains notes about the document, such as title, author, and etc. For now, skip the summary sheets by pressing Enter. The message line displays a report of how many characters were saved. If you have a diskette system, the number of bytes unused on the disk will appear in the parentheses. The command menu reappears. Also note, the file name appears in the lower right corner of the edit window border. You may now resume editing or use a command from the menu. If you subsequently do another save in the same editing session, Word will fill in the file name field with the name that you entered on the initial save, including the file's path name. For example, 
When the transfer save command is chosen again, the path name appears and shows our file text1 is in the Word directory or drive C. Press the Enter key to execute the save. Retrieving a document from a disk is the reverse of a save and is called a load in this word processor. Let's say you have saved a document and quit Word. In order to do more editing on the document, start Word and do a load operation on the file containing your document. Choose the transfer load menu by pressing Escape, then the T key, followed by the L key. The transfer load menu now appears in the command area. The message line displays a prompt to enter the file name or select it from the list. The transfer load menu contains the file name field in which you must specify the name of the disk file containing your document. You have two ways to enter the file name. If you remember the file name, just type it in. Our file was named text1. If no path name was typed, as in our case, Word looks for the document in the current directory in a hard disk system. Otherwise, it looks on drive B in a diskette system. To look for the document anyplace else, the full path name must be typed in the file name field. For this lesson, we can ignore the read-only option in the menu. In either case, once the file name is entered, just press the Enter key to execute the load. When the load is complete, the message line displays a report of how many characters were loaded, and for diskette systems, how many bytes remain unused on the disk. When this message appears, the transfer load menu disappears and the command menu reappears. The second way to enter the file name is to look it up. You must examine the list of files on that disk and select the one you want. When the transfer load menu appears, press the function F1 key. This will cause the edit window to be replaced by a blank screen. Then you will see displayed the file names of every document in the directory. The names will have an extension of DOC. Use the four direction keys to move the highlight to the document you want to load. When you press Enter, the load will start. Of course, the directory displayed will be from the current directory in a hard disk system or the drive B in the diskette system. If you want to get a directory from any place else, type the path name in the file name field and then press F1. Suppose you want to restart Word to work on a specific document. Do this at the DOS prompt in the Word directory. Type Word, then a space, and the document name. In our case, that's text1, and press Enter. When Word is loaded into the computer, it automatically retrieves the named document. Here's one more shortcut. Suppose you want to restart Word to work on the last document that was edited. Do this at the DOS prompt in the Word directory. Type Word, then a space, slash L, and Enter. When Word is loaded into the computer, it automatically retrieves the last document you edited. If you haven't done so already, I suggest you immediately do a save on that literary masterpiece you've been creating. Let's print our document now. I must remind you that the setup program covered in Lesson 1 must be run before you do any printing. Setup is used to tell Word about your printer. If you don't do so, Word may not know your printer even exists. Now, on with the printing. Press the Escape key, then the P key, and finally press the P key once again to execute the printer command. This sends the document to the printer. Word breaks up your text into pages while it prints the document. If for some reason you want to stop the printing altogether, just press the Escape key twice. This is useful if the paper jams in the printer. Then you need to repaginate the document to set the page breaks before printing. Here's an example document we've already created that's a few pages long. Press the Escape key, then the P, R, and finally Enter. After repaginating, just scroll through the document to see where the page breaks occur. These breaks appear as dotted lines. Finally, we come to how to quit the Word program. When you're done using Word, select the Quit command so the Word program can put everything away, clean out text scraps, and return you to the DOS prompt. It's very simple to quit Word. Follow the example now. Press the Escape key, then the Q key to select the Quit command.
If you saved your work before quitting, the edit screen will disappear and the DOS prompt will return. Once you see this prompt, you can start other programs or turn off the computer. If by some chance you edited text but didn't save it before selecting quit, Word detects this and gives you one last chance to save it. After pressing escape and Q, Word prompts you on the message line with options to save it, lose the edits, or cancel the quit command. When you make your choice, that action will be executed and the edit screen will disappear. If you want to start a new document, you don't have to quit Word first. Instead, you can close the document and start a new one. This is done with the window close command. Press escape, then W, and C. You are prompted to enter a window number. For this lesson, that's always one. Just press enter and the current document will be saved. If by some chance there's any unsaved edits, Word detects this and gives you one last chance to save them, just like before. When the edit window is blank, you can start typing a new document just like we did at the beginning of this tape. This next part of the lesson is about searching and replacing. These techniques speed up certain kinds of editing. Suppose you want to edit a phrase buried deep in a thick manuscript. Scrolling manually takes too long, but the search command automatically takes you right to the spot. Here's a simple example of searching using the sample document you typed earlier. Make sure the highlight is at the top. Use the Escape and S keys to bring up the search menu to the command area. The text to be searched for must be typed in the text field. For this example, use the word Manual. The direction field default is down. This causes the search to go from the current location to the end. Press Enter, and the sought-after word is highlighted, ready for editing. Suppose you want to change a word or phrase. Manually selecting and editing the word takes time, but the replace command automatically substitutes the new word or phrase for the old. Let's do a replacement in our document. Move the highlight to the top and use the Escape and R keys to bring up the Replace menu. The text to be replaced goes in the text field. Use Software Manual. The substitute text goes in the Width text field. After pressing the Tab key, type User Manual. The Confirm field has a default of Yes. You'll be prompted to confirm each replacement beforehand. Press Enter, and the sought-after phrase appears. The Replacement menu prompts you for the confirmation, so press Y. The Replace command continues processing the entire document. When done, it tells how many replacements it made. Suppose we want to replace a portion of the document. To change this, select the segment of text to be processed before replacing. Both Search and Replace have an option to exactly match the capitalization of the text segment. Let's see this in action. With the highlight at the top of the document, search for Easy Learn, all letters in uppercase. Choose the Yes option in the Case field and execute it. Search went past the word Easy Learn because it is in lowercase and the search text is capitalized. The No option in the Case field causes the capitalization to be ignored. Repeat the search you just did with the case set to No. This time, Easy Learn was found. The default case option is No. Search and Replace also have an option to look for whole words. A whole word is one surrounded by tabs, spaces, new line characters, or punctuation. If Yes is selected in the Whole Word field, the program will search for whole words only. Another quick example in the sample document will show this. With the highlight at the top, search for Man with the letters in lower case. Set the whole word option to Yes and execute it. Search skip the word many because it is not an exact match for the search text. When the whole word field has the no option, the commands will find any word that includes the search text. Repeat the search you just did with the whole word set to no. This time man was found, even though it's part of the word many. The default word option is no. Here's how to speed up searching and replacing. 
To repeat the last search action, press Shift and F4. To repeat the last replace action, use the Shift and F4 followed by another F4. Also, the No option in the Confirm field saves the time needed to confirm each replacement. Our next section is about windows. So far, we've been using only one edit window to work on text, but Word allows more than one edit window on the screen at the same time. Windows are useful when you need to work on several parts of a long document at the same time, or even on several documents at the same time. The basic steps for using a window are opening it, doing any editing on it, and closing the window. Let's see these steps used for two windows on one document. A new window is opened by splitting an existing window. Use the Escape W and S keys to choose the Window Split command. Usually the window is split horizontally, so press Enter. Now tell it where to split by typing a line number. 10 will do fine for us. After you press Enter, the second window appears magically. Opened, let's copy some text between windows. Move the highlight to the end of the document and copy the last sentence. Use the Escape, C, and Enter keys to copy the sentence. Press the F1 key to activate and change to the other window. Move the highlight to the start of the document and insert the copied sentence. That's all there is to it. The only new trick is the F1 key for changing windows. When done with the window, be sure to close it. It's a simple operation. Use the keys Escape, W, and C to display the Close menu. Then type the window number, which is 2 in this example, and press Enter. Magically, the window disappears and the other window is adjusted to fill the screen. The next item is how to open windows on several documents. Basically, the same procedure is used, namely type Escape, W, and S, Again, use a horizontal split and split at line 10. The twist is the Yes option in the Clear New Window field. Tab to this field and choose Yes. After you press Enter, a blank window appears. And now we need to load the window with a document, so load the original copy of the sample text in File Text 2. It's simple to move text between documents. Scroll the active window to the end of the document and delete the last sentence. Now activate the other window with F1. Move the highlight to the top. Insert the deleted sentence. Not very difficult. We'll finish up with a couple of miscellaneous window commands. You can change the size of any window with the Window Move command. Use Escape, W, and M to choose the command. Type the number of the window to be resized, in this case, 1. Then tab to the to row field and type in a new line number for the border. Make it 15. Pressing Enter executes the resizing. Whenever the Control and F1 keys are pressed, the active window is zoomed. The initials ZM appear in the status line as a reminder. Press Control and F1 again, and the window is restored to its original size. It's also possible to clear a window after it's been opened. Make the lower window active and choose the Transfer Clear Window command. Use the keys Escape, T, C, and W. Press Enter and also press N to lose our edits to our original copy of the sample and the window is cleared. Here are the major points. Windows are used to work on many text segments at the same time. The segments can all be in one document or in several different documents. A window is opened with an Escape, W, and S keys. The F1 key activates a different window. Use the Escape, W, and C keys to close a window. A glossary is a collection of often used text segments. For example, a glossary can contain your mailing address, stock paragraphs, commonly called boilerplate text, and the like. It saves time because only a few keystrokes are needed to insert glossary text in a document. Creating a glossary entry consists of creating the text and storing it in the glossary file. For a demonstration, we'll put a return address in the sample document and store it in the glossary. At the start of your sample, type your return address. 
then select it. And choose the copy command. Type an entry name such as my address. Names can be up to 31 characters long. Be sure to use the hyphen as spaces are not allowed in an entry name. Pressing enter stores the text in the glossary in memory. We need one more glossary entry for a later exercise. Select the first sentence in the sample and choose the copy command. Type the name boilerplate and press enter. The procedure to insert a glossary entry into your document takes only a few keystrokes. Locate the highlight where you want the entry inserted. In this exercise, let's put it at the end of the document. Choose the insert command, that's escape I, and then press F1. A list of glossary names appears. Some of the names are supplied by word as a convenience. Use the direction keys to highlight the one you want, which of course is my address, press enter, and the entry appears in your document ready for editing. Be sure to remove the address from the end of the document before moving on. From time to time, you might need to delete entries from a glossary. The command for this is transfer glossary clear, and the key sequence is escape, T, G, and C. Press F1 to display the list of glossary entries. With the highlight on boilerplate, press Enter. A prompt appears to confirm the clear. Type Y. Because the glossary we've been working on is found only in the memory, it will vanish when the power is turned off. It should be stored in a disk file if any additions or deletions were made to it. The default glossary file is named normal.gly. Use the keys Escape, T, G, and S to choose the Transfer Glossary Save command. The default glossary file name appears. Press Enter and the glossary text is saved on disk. It's possible to have separate glossaries for different types of documents. A new glossary is made by saving the current glossary with a different name. Let's do this on our document. Choose the Transfer Glossary Save command. The current glossary file name appears. Type the new name. I'm using the name Letters with an extension of GLY. Press Enter when done. The new glossary file is created. Clear out the glossary names in memory with the Transfer Glossary Clear command. That's Escape, T, G, C, and Enter. Next, a prompt appears to confirm the clear. Respond by typing Y. And that's the end of Lesson 2. Lesson 3 will continue right where we left off.